Man, that was awesome. Thank you, choir, so much. I love being at a church that still has a choir that sings and ministers to us. That's incredible. Pastor Brett, Julie, you know, if uh, New Hope ever doesn't work out, I think uh, the Gaithers have a traveling spot open for you guys, man. That, that was just fantastic. Hey, it is great to be here this morning. Happy Father's Day to the fathers out there. Uh, before I get real started into my sermon, I would just want to make an invite. I've been having, you've been seeing in your bulletins, uh, that I've been having cookouts. We started with the 20s, we had a blast. Then we went to the 60s, then we did the 50s Friday night. Monday night is the 40s, so if you are in your 40s, don't insult me and ignore my invitation. I want you to come to my house. I want to have a good time. Tomorrow night, uh, we're gonna have a blast. Kids are welcome, so wives, that means you can bring your husband. Um, and, you know, we're just going to have a, a great time uh, fellowshipping. And there's a 30s, and then there's a 70s plus uh, in July, so be on the lookout for that. So today's Father's Day, and naturally I'm going to be sharing a, uh, a Father's Day message. Um, but if you aren't a father, don't tune this message out because it's applicable to everyone, whether you're an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a mother, a grandparent, uh, just a, a mentor of some uh, sort. There is, there is stuff to be extracted from this sermon and applied in the relationships that we have. My dad isn't here this morning. Uh, he's on uh, vacation with my sister. They took a, a daddy-daughter uh, trip, and, and he's having a good time. And, and since he's not here, I thought it would be a great opportunity to tell some stories about my dad. Now, I think that's only fair because all my life, he's told a whole bunch of stories about me. So how many are okay with me telling some stories on my dad? Well, we'll, we'll start off with this one. Uh, it's the time that my dad embarrassed me the most. And, and trust me, there's been many, many times that my dad has embarrassed me, if not on a daily basis. However, this takes the cake. I was 14 years old. We just finished a, a, a baseball season. And I think we had lost three games that year. We were uh, the uh, champions. We had beat Urbandale and Johnson, and, or not Urbandale, I was at Urbandale, Ankeny and Johnson and all the different teams. We were the tournament county champions. And my dad said, well, let's celebrate. Let's go down to Worlds of Fun in Kansas City. So uh, if you can remember back to being 14 years old, you kind of think you run the roost. If you ever drive and you see kids on skateboards or bikes because they're not old enough to have cars yet, man, you think you own the neighborhood. You're rolling through there and you're like, man, I'm tough stuff. And it's like, man, you don't know anything. You're, you haven't even gone through puberty, boy. And, um, you know, so we're, we're at Worlds of Fun. We're having a good time. And my friends and I went on this water ride where there's a, um, like two arms and then a huge, you know, three sets, uh, uh, section where you sit down on it and it lifts you up and then it starts to spin you around and it flips you upside down and everything and then there's water that shoots up in your face and it's this cruel form of punishment that someone thought would be fun to put in an amusement park. So I'm sitting, uh, my dad doesn't go on the ride because he's older and wiser uh, than us kids and, and I'm sitting here, my friend Nick Staub is sitting here and uh, then there was these two girls that were a couple years older than us, and they were good looking, okay? They, they, they had definitely caught our attention and stuff. So the ride goes up, starts to shake us around, starts to flip us up and down. All of a sudden, the girl that's sitting two, two seats next to me, uh, her flip-flop goes, boom, and it flies off and it lands down there. So my dad, during the ride, he starts yelling, Austin, that girl's thong fell off. You can go down and pick it up. And when you give it to her, get her number. P pick it up and get her number. Yes. Yes. My dad told a, hormo a hormonal 14-year-old to pick up a girl's thong and get her number. And uh, it, was, it was horrible. Uh, and, and this lady, uh, eventually, after he yelled for probably 15 or 20 seconds, at the top of his lungs, and my dad's no quiet Joe, you know, I mean, you, you know he, 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 uh, he isn't, comes up, taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, sir, um, when, when we were children, we called uh, those things songs, but they're actually called flip-flops. Songs are, are something else. If you don't know what it is, just think massive wedgie, um, and we'll move on, we'll move on from there. So, 
You know, there's been many, 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 many times where my dad has embarrassed me, but I will say this, that for every time my dad has embarrassed me, he's probably made me proud a dozen or more times. And I love him, I admire him. I wish he could be here. I'm sure you're uh, creeping on us on the interwebs, uh, but get off and spend time with Taylor today and enjoy yourselves. So the title of my sermon this morning is Why I Admire My Father. And this will be a different style of sermon. I don't typically preach in this uh, way, but this is something I felt very led to do. I'm gonna be sharing a lot of stories about my dad and the things that he taught me uh, while growing up. And he's by no means a perfect father, um, but I'm very thankful that I have a heavenly father that is perfect, just as Pastor Hawkins shared. He's, he's perfect in his grace. He's perfect in his uh, forgiveness and his mercy. He's, he's infinite in his wisdom. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was fortunate to have a good father, and I know that not everyone in here share that, that same um, uh, common ground. But I, I want today to focus on God, our Heavenly Father, because there were times where, where my dad couldn't cheer me up, and I needed my perfect father from heaven to cheer me up. There were times where my dad's wisdom fell short and I needed my heavenly father's wisdom to fill in the gaps. And, and that's the beautiful thing about it. We have a heavenly father that's reaching out to you, to all of us, no matter our backgrounds, no matter our upbringings, and he wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to pour out his love. He wants to, to walk with you, to encourage you, to fill those shoes that, that maybe weren't filled when you grew up. And so this morning as we celebrate Father's Day, um, let's spend more time celebrating our perfect Father in heaven than our earthly ones. Um, and if you've never received a peace in your heart that when you die that you would go to heaven this morning, I, at the end I'm gonna give you the opportunity to reserve. If, if God's been knocking at your door, if he's been pulling your heartstrings, don't ignore that call anymore. It's time for you to get right with Jesus. It's time to ask him into your heart to, for the forgiveness of your sins that he would save you. Uh, this is something very serious, and I want to give you that opportunity. Before we go any further, let's pray, and, and then we'll get started. Jesus, I just pray that you would speak through me this morning. Uh, God, that, that you would say anything and everything that you would want, and, and just quicken this word by your Holy Spirit, and uh, just allow us to, to focus on you this morning, our good and perfect Father. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said... Amen, amen. So I, my dad and I have some great memories together, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of memories together. But, you know, some of my most meaningful memories were actually the day in and the day out, mundane memories with my dad. And, and my dad chose to drive us kids to school every day. Now, consider yourself lucky because you come on Sunday and you get preached at for 30 minutes once a week. Dad had the car rides to try out all of his jokes on us, to uh, pour out his wisdom and, and speak to us. And that five minute car ride um, between here and, or for, from my house to the school ended up being essentially like a, a practicing preaching moments. And there are five minutes of just pouring in his wisdom and speaking to us kids. And, um, I, you know, I, in, in middle school, I, I remember there was two things that that uh, he would always talk about. He'd say, Austin, if you don't watch yourself, if you aren't careful, you'll start speaking just like a sailor. There's, there's kids that are using inappropriate language, and when you're at school, Austin, you need to think, when I hear a bad word, I identify it and say, weavers don't speak that way. Christians don't speak that way. You need to identify that as a sin and, and, and mentally check that off so you don't uh, talk that way. And Austin, eventually someone's going to pull something out and place it in front of you. There's going to be pornography. There's going to be a magazine. This happens all the time to kids in middle school. And Austin, in that moment, you need to decide right now what you're going to do. Has anybody pulled that out? Has anybody tried to show you? No, Dad, you told me that yesterday and the day before that. And I'll get annoyed and I'd show the attitude and I would, I would push him away. You know, and, and while I was very annoyed um, as a kid, I, I was very, very thankful uh, that, that he continued to teach me and, and to, to push me in that. Um, you know, he'd say things like, to, to have a friend, you have to be a friend, Austin. And unfortunately, most people don't know how to be good friends. So you just have to rise up. You have to love them when they don't always love you. You have to pursue them and make friends with them even when they don't call you because most people don't 
know how to be that friend. Austin, you be that friend. Or, or uh, your job right now is, is to get good grades. Hard work is your job. Hard work is going to create a, a pattern of hard work. And l- the Bible says that laziness oftentimes leads to poverty. Or, or he'd say, you might be the only Jesus that someone sees today, Austin. Make God proud. Make God proud. You know, I was annoyed, but I look back and I appreciate that so much. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, or in our day and age, when you drive along the road. When you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now hindsight is clear and it's obvious, but he was teaching me little by little. He was indoctrinating me. He was teaching me the way that I live. Every day, my dad would lay this brick of wisdom so that I would have a foundation that I am now standing on today. He took those, those moments and, and he, would, he would place that. He would, he would, he would speak to me. And, and those five-minute talks, I can't tell you how thankful I am. That, those five-minute talks, um, and by God's grace, helped me to remain pure until I was married. Those five-minute talks helped me know what to do when, when someone uh, passed something to me that I didn't want to be in, uh, involved with. Those five-minute talks helped me in my walk. You know, if you didn't already know this, my dad grew up in Texas, which if uh, you didn't already know that, it would explain a lot. Um, But he grew up in Texas, and he loved sports. And and back when he and Moses were a kid, um, he... (laughs) There was only three uh, TV channels. Now, any, any other people grow up in that? Okay, tell Moses hi for me, you know. <laughs> um, three TV channels, and he loved sports, but uh, back then we didn't have ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN Ocho. We had uh, just three TV channels, and the two teams of the MLB that, that were kind of in a rivalry were the Yankees and the Cardinals. And, and when a sports game would be televised, that's who, they would, um, that's who they would show. And so my dad, being a winner himself, obviously started rooting for the Yankees. And he is a big Yankees fan. He grew up with Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle and Yogi Berra. You know, people always say, well, how come your dad, he's from Texas, how come we didn't root for the, the Astros or the Rangers? Well, the Astros were actually not a MLB team until 1962. They were actually called the Houston Colt 45s. Anybody remember that? And then uh, in 1972 came uh, the, the Rangers. And so my dad made the clear and obvious decision. Now, he would talk to me about those great players in the 50s and the 60s. I grew up in the Derek Jeter era. Uh, We watched games together. We talked about it together. We would go to Minnesota. I've seen Minnesota and the Yankees play 13 different times, and my record is 13-0. I have never seen the Yankees lose against Minnesota. Talk about God's favor on God's favorite team. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay? Man, we, we went out to, to New York, and we toured the stadium, and, and my dad bought me Yankee shirts, jerseys, even a hat, you know, and um, he, he would throw our, his passion, our time, even our money, our words towards the Yankees. Now, guess which team I root for today? The Cubs. Who said that? <laughs> that's, that's so... Pastor Brian... Uh, I'm going to drag you up here and get you saved, boy. (laughs) Okay? No, I root for the Yankees, right? My dad guided my heart to be passionate about the Yankees. He spent time indoctrinating me to love the Yankees. Now listen here. Please listen up and hear these words. If you are not spending time indoctrinating your kids with biblical truths, then the world will indoctrinate them with worldly lies. If you do not guide your kid's heart into loving God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength, then the world is going to pull them away and and it's going to guide them into get all you can while you can and this will make you happy and that will make you happy and look this way and have this and have those things. We need to guide our kids how to love the Lord 
and how to be passionate about God. My, my dad didn't just guide my heart to love the Yankees. He took responsibility and he guided my heart to love God. Listen, your kids are your main responsibilities. They're not Mandy's. They're not Pastor Courtney's. They're not Pastor Luke's. They're not Pastor Brian. They're not Pastor Zach's. Yes, they are a part of responsibility, but we as parents and grandparents and spiritual parents and spiritual grandparents need to rise to the occasion and say, you know what? My kids are, take top priority. I need to raise them and guide them into all truth. My dad took that responsibility. He guided my heart into biblical truth. He guided my heart to be passionate about godly things, about missions, about evangelism, about serving, loving people. He made sure that when I was in high school, I went on a short-term mission trip. Man, I'll tell you what, that forever impacted my life. He made sure that we served together. For over two years, we, we cleaned bathrooms over in the other, uh, the church, and I learned the importance of serving, scrubbing toilets next to my dad. You know, he, he, he took me down to the hospital and, and to visit sick people and to pray with them. He guided my heart where it needed to be. Passion is transferred. Passion is transferred. And, and it's not just transferred, but it's transferred generation to generation. There are people that are Chevy lovers because great grandpa Jimmy was a Chevy enthusiast. Whether it's cars or whether it's a sports team, music, fishing, whatever it is, let's rise up and be a church that are passionate about God. Let's transfer our passion and our zeal for God to our children and to our grandchildren. Now what I'm gonna say next may come as a surprise to many of you, if not all of you. My dad is very intelligent. <laughs> he, he did a lot of things uh, that I would have never known he did unless he would have told me so that I could do the same thing for, for my kids. For instance, uh, anytime a, a kid from school, or most times a kid from school, would come and say, hey Austin, why don't you spend the night? And I'd go to dad and say, hey dad, can I spend the night at Jimmy's house? He would say, well how about, how about you uh, invite Jimmy over to our house? I'll take you guys out and we'll go bowling beforehand. Does that sound like fun? Or, or let's go to the iCubs game, or let's get pizza, or let's go swimming, or let's do something. You know, back then I was like, sweet, the, the, the pot has been sweetened. You know, heat up the ante. And, and I thought, well, my dad just loves to have fun. You know, it's just kind of an excuse for uh, a, a male to, to resort to childhood, you know. Um, and I'm sure that's partly true. But what my dad was actually doing was he was controlling the environment in which I spent my time. My dad didn't let me spend time at just anybody's house because he didn't know what would be watched on TV. He didn't know if there would be a liquor cabinet left unlocked. He didn't know if the kid had found his dad's porn stash and was gonna put that on me. He knew what was going on at his house. He knew there wasn't gonna be uh, garbage going on at our house. Only two times in my childhood did anybody ever try to show me pornography, and both times happened at different people's houses that I was over to. Their parents weren't home, they had found their dad's uh, magazines, and they tried to do it. But guess what? Because of those five-minute talks, because of the, the over and over and the pounding and the telling over and over, not just a one-time talk, the over and over and over times, it was easy for me in that moment to say, no, let's go outside and play baseball. And the other time I said, no, let's go outside and skateboard. I'm so thankful that I had a dad that cared about where I, 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 I spent my time. You know, I... I wanted to work as soon as I turned 14 years old. I've always loved uh, to work, but my dad didn't want me just to have any job. So he, he said, Austin, why don't you start your own business? And I don't know if anybody has been coming to church long enough, but we used to have a, a business directory, and I had a little page in there called Austin's Odd Jobs. And I would do anything. I'd mow your lawn. I'd pick up your pet's poop. I would... Uh, I would take care of your dog, do dog sitting. I cleaned out gutters. I helped people move. You know, uh, I just did my own uh, work, you know. And in hindsight, I didn't understand. But my, my dad knew that work environments can be very vulgar. Work environments can be very dark places. He didn't want his 14-year-old being educated about sex by some 24 or 25-year-old that, that has no business talking about those things. 
I tell high school students and college students this all the time, uh, and I warn them ab- ab- about how dark the, the workplace can be, um, I, 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 as particularly in the food industry. And, and I say, man, you, you better be careful because there's lots of hooking up. There's, there's lots of... Um, uh, drugs that, that get passed around. A lot of people just want to go out and party after a, a long day's um, rest. And, and usually the kids are just like, oh yeah, I know, I know, I went to public school, I know this. But I kid you not, I have never, I, excuse me, I'll say it this way, that was going to get tongue twisty. Every single one of those people at some point has come back to me and said, Austin, you were right. You tried to warn me and I had no idea what I was getting into. Not that they had fallen, but they appreciated that warning. You know, I I know it doesn't work in everyone's schedule, but my dad, uh, one of the reasons that he drove me to school, besides practicing his lame jokes and his sermons on us, uh, was was so that we weren't on the school bus being exposed to ungodly things. I've talked to many middle schoolers, elementary even, um, and high schoolers, that the first time that they, they saw things, the first time that they were offered uh, tobacco or whatever it was, was on that unsupervised bus ride to school. Now, I don't preach any of this to create fear, nor do I preach this to create guilt. Uh, eventually, your kids have to face the real word, world and stand for themselves. We can't completely shelter our kids from everything because someday we won't be able to, but It's our job as parents to set up our kids for success in their faith. And I find it very wise, hear me, I find it very wise to limit the number of opportunities for your kids to get ensnared in something. That doesn't mean we lock them in their rooms until they're 30, even though that's what I'm doing with Paisley because I don't want any boy touching her, looking at her, or talking to her, or anything else. But you as parents, we, we need to be aware of, of where our kids are spending time and what they're spending time doing. Ask yourself this, do you know what your kids are being exposed to? Do you know what your kids are being exposed to in your own house? It's easier to bury your head in the sand and remain ignorant. Technology is scary, it's difficult to understand, but your kids need to be educated by you, not by social media, not by a, a dirty TV show at a neighbor's house, not by your neighbor. Uh, hood kids. We, we, we need that. Another reason that I really appreciated my dad, another thing, is that he was obedient to God. Now, whether it was in God's written will, which is the Bible, he would follow the, uh, the Bible, or it was the leading of the Holy Spirit, my dad did his best. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Don't hear that. Um, but he did his best to obey uh, the Lord. John Uh, 14 says, you know, if you love me, Jesus says this, you'll obey my commandments. James chapter 4 says those who know what they ought to do, meaning God has laid something on their heart to do it, but they don't do it, they are sinning. And so my my dad raised me, he taught me that, and I've I've been with him many, many times where all of a sudden he pulls a Yui and I'm thinking, what are we doing? We're going this way. And it's like, I need to, I need to go back and talk to this person. I need to do this. But one of the earliest times that I actually remember that happening, I was probably five years old. We're back at Merle Hay Mall, uh, back when they had the fountain and the creepy naked statue, statue man with the wings. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about? Merle Hayes. All the people that aren't from Des Moines, they're like, what? <laughs> right? Um, and we're walking down one of those ramps, and we get down, it starts to level out, and there's this group of, of teenagers. Now, I, I don't mean to judge, but they look kind of rebellious. They look kind of like mall rats. They, they look like they're up, uh, not, not to really anything good. And we walk by, and we go by the um, fountain. We go by the naked angel man. I cover my eyes. Um, I go back up the, the uh, ramp, and I, we get about almost to the top, um, and I, I remember, you know, running my hand across the red brick there, you know, and holding dad's hand in the other, and he stops. He goes, Austin, I feel like we need to go talk to those teenagers. And we turn around, we walk down, shield my eyes again, go across the, the, um, the pool. We go up to these kids, and my dad, being the shy introvert that he is, uh, mustered up the confidence to start talking to them. And, and, you know, I don't know what was said in that. You could kind of see them kind of taken back, but then they warmed up. And I'm sure he did the Christian thing, invited them to church and everything. But in that moment, 
I was so young, but I still remember it so clear that my dad yielded to the Holy Spirit. He obeyed. He risked looking like a crazy to do something because God had laid that on his heart. You know, just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were in the hospital and Tom Rivetuso was having a, a pretty major heart surgery and we're sitting there with family and, and um, all of a sudden my dad gets up and there's these, uh, a mom and a daughter that's just kind of sitting off to, to my right and I was like, well, that's fine. He talks to everybody. He's from Texas. Um, and I look back about three or four minutes later and they're both just, just bawling. They're just, they're just crying and I'm thinking, oh great, what did he say to offend them? No. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in, in that moment, my dad was just to encourage them and tell them and remind them of God's love for them and that he's watching out. And, you know, I don't know who was in surgery at that time, but they needed that. And my dad yielded to that. I remember one time uh, my dad feeling led to give a large sum of money to missions. And I'm not talking just a, a, a large, you know, thing. I mean, it was a big chunk of money. And, and, and he did it. He talked with my mom and they made it work and, and they, they cut back on things and they made sacrifices and they reallocated and they stopped saving and they did all these different things to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm so thankful that my dad talked to me about his finances. I'm so thankful that he showed me what he gave. He didn't do that so that I would look at him and say, oh, my dad's the best dad in the whole world. No, he did that so that when God lays something on my heart, I've got the confidence to follow through with it because I've seen God come through for him time in and time out again, right? I've, I've seen when my dad turns around and he talks to those people and I've seen the fruitful conversations. I've seen the times where he's, he's been obedient in those uh, times of giving. There are a lot more stories and, and things that, that my dad did well uh, raising Taylor and I and I don't have time to, to tell all those. Um, and there's another three or four sermons, you know, that I could tell of, of things that he didn't do well. And, and things, uh, whether he didn't do well, that I watched him not do well and I learned from, or things that he had made previous mistakes or his father taught him of previous mistakes of his father, that, that he did it. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I don't want to uh, glorify my, my dad in any way, um, but he did do a lot of things right. If I were to compactly tell you why I admire my dad, I would use these three words. Character, consistency, and presence. Character, consistency, and presence. My dad, uh, he's definitely not perfect in his character. He has flaws, but he earnestly and hardly works to um, diligently improve and, and work on his character his whole life. He opens rebuke. He doesn't get defensive most of the time. Um, you know, I, I didn't just have a dad that told me how to act, do as I say, not as I do, dad. I had a dad that showed me by his character. He showed me how to be generous. He showed me how to live godly. He demonstrated how to act by his character. Hear me, fathers, your character matters. Your character doesn't matter. It also matters to be consistent. My dad's character was consistent. What you saw and what you see on Sundays is what you get Monday through Saturday. You know, he didn't just love the Lord with, with all his might and soul and strength on Sundays. He loved God and did his best to abide by his word and follow the Holy Spirit day in and day out. Dads, step up and be consistent. It matters. Be consistent in your discipline. Be consistent in your expectations with your kids. That's unfair. Be consistent in your character. Be consistent in the amount of time you spend with them. One Saturday a month of undivided attention doesn't go nearly as far as one or two hours a night having undivided attention where you can be involved and not play catch up for the past four weeks of, of I've been too busy or this or that. Be consistent in everything. Character, consistency, and presence. And my dad was there for me. I remember one time I was in fourth grade uh, and my dad, I don't know if he was just bored or uh, having a rough day, I don't know why, but he pulled me out of class towards the end of the day, a couple hours left. I'm sorry, school teachers, I'm sure that frustrates you. And he just wanted to play catch with his son. <laughs> and I just, you know, it's moments like that where, 
where my dad wanted to spend time with me. Man, that's the greatest gift. Your presence as a father, as a parent, is the greatest thing that you can give your child. If I had a dollar every time I went to a funeral and I heard someone say, oh, what I would do just to have one more cup of coffee with mom. Oh, what I would do just to play one more round of golf with dad. Oh, what I would do just to have one more dinner or one more day with my parents. Pastor Zach says this to the middle schoolers all the time. He says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Essentially, show me the people you spend time with and I'll show you how you're going to turn out. Guess what? If you spend time with your kids, they're going to turn out to be a lot like you. Now, some of you are thinking, Lord, please don't let them turn out to be anything like me. You know, and in some sense, I understand that. I want my kid to be better than me. I I want the the foundation that my dad laid for me and then I want to lay a foundation for my son and and I I don't want them to struggle with things and, and to learn the same mistakes over and over. I want my kids to be better. I understand that. You know, one of the things that's very concerning as a pastor is we live in a day and age where we're fathers, we're parents, we're families, we're just America. We're living like Timothy says. We're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I'll tell you, it drives me nuts. It drives me nuts when people say, well, Sunday nights are family night. You know? Bring them to church and pray together. If you're having church at your house with your family, great. I'm all for it. I'm great. But I'll tell you what, watching your favorite Netflix with your family versus getting in the presence of God and praying for one another and getting real with one another, there's spiritual merit in one and there's not much merit in the other. I, I, I pray that all of you fathers this morning, if I were to ask you, is your character good? Are you consistent in your character? Do you spend time with your kids? I, 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 my prayer is that all of you would say yes. Without hesitation, yes, I have good character. Yes, I am consistent. Yes, I do spend time with them. Would you all close your eyes, bow your heads this morning? Some musicians come. In just a minute, I'm gonna give the opportunity for anyone who has not yet truly surrendered completely to Jesus to do so. But before I do that, I wanna take a minute and talk about God, our Father. I understand that not all of us had a James Weaver as a dad, but we do all have the same equal opportunity to have a perfect father. First, God's character. God is perfect in every way. He is love, he is truth. He's full of grace, of forgiveness, of mercy. He's faithful, he has infinite wisdom. He has strength when we need it. He is kind, he's compassionate, he's caring. God, our Father, is perfect in every single way. Second, our God is consistent. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has created a perfect track record for us to look back at the promises that he's made to say, yes, God was the same. Yes, God's character is true. His promises never go void. He is who he says he is. And thirdly, God's presence. He's everywhere, he holds it all together. When you're at work, he's with you. When you're at school, he's with you. When you're in the car, he's with you. At the lake, at home, on a trip. When you're lonely and you're crying, when you're depressed, when you've just at the ends of your wits, God is with you. Whether you had an awesome father or, or, or not much of a father at all, this morning, turn your eyes to God, our perfect father. God wants to be in a a, a relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. He wants to walk with you, to talk to you, to guide you, to comfort you. God wants to be your father this morning. He wants to fill the voids that your earthly father haven't uh, met. He wants to be everything for you this morning. So with eyes closed, out of respect for your neighbor, is there anyone here this morning that wants to give their heart to God our Father? You're not sure that if you were to die in this moment that you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus. Is there anyone here that wants to repent of their sins, ask Jesus to forgive them, to cleanse them, to save them of their soul? Would you raise your hand right now so I can pray for you? Yes. Yes, I see you. Yes. Yes, I see you in the back. Jesus, you see all these hands, Lord, and I just pray right now that this would not um, 
just be a, a moment, uh, a conversion moment, but this would be a, a change of direction for these people's lives moment, that, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, you would cleanse them and wash their sins white as snow, that you would set their feet in paths of righteousness, God, minister to them by your grace and your mercy. Would they understand who you are, the perfect, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing uh, uh, God that you are? And I just pray that you would redirect them, save them, and, and, and give them purpose and meaning. Continued with eyes closed and heads bowed, I wanna ask if there's any fathers that, that need to step up your game. You want your kids to admire your passion for God. You want to transfer that passion. You may need to create more discipline in your, your family devotions. You may need to start having intentional five minute talks with them. You may need to start treating your wife the way that she deserves and, and the way that, that your kids need to see it, whatever that might be. If you're here this morning and, and you'd say, I need to work on my character, I need to be more consistent, I need to be more present, would you raise your hand just saying, Austin, by God's help, I want to become a better father. Yes, there's hands all over. Who else? Yes, yes, yes. Jesus, right now in this moment, I pray your Holy Spirit would empower every one of these men. I thank you for the humility. It's not easy to say that we need work, God, but I pray that this would not just be a, a moment of admittance, of, of, of admitting something that, that we see a lack need, but this would be a, a moment of power where your Holy Spirit enters us and, and enables us to do and the things that you do to love and to forgive and to be there and to comfort and, and to exhort and uphold our families, Jesus. God, help us be more like you in everything we say and everything we do.